people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. What was the four round destruction of Terry Harper, reigning WBA junior middleweight champion, two division champion overall at the hands of Sandy Ryan, current reigning WBO welterweight champion. Initially, I went with Sandy Ryan to win a points decision and she went a step further and forced a stoppage. Terry retired in her corner after four rounds. She was too big, too strong on the inside for Terry Harper who moved down in weight for this fight. Wait a minute, what do you mean she was too big and too strong? Didn't you just say Terry moved down? She did. She moved down from junior middle down to welter for this fight, but you have to remember that Terry was never a true junior middleweight. She was never a true 154 pounder. She used to campaign all the way down there at 130. Then how on earth did she become a champion at 154? She won the vacant WBA title opposite the ring Hannah Rankin about two or three fights ago. And even though Terry was never a true junior middleweight, she still carried a lot of speed up there. Speed and some power. Power. She was never going to have the durability, the punch resistance of a true junior middleweight or the core strength, which is why she was so easily overpowered by Sandy Ryan mid-range to inside. Even if she was able to carry some power and some speed up to 154 at 147 against a fighter with as high a ceiling as Sandy Ryan, with the ability and strength of a Sandy Ryan. She was just outgunned. Outfought. She got off to a decent enough start, seemingly trying to match Sandy Ryan's aggression, attempting to fight fire with fire. In the first round. The first round was the only remotely competitive round, but it was still a round that I gave to Sandy Ryan. The difference. You could see it. The different reactions to when Terry Harper lands a punch on Sandy and when Sandy lands punches on Terry. At times, Terry's entire body was jolted by the punches, moved. Rock. She didn't get off to a bad start, but in the second round, in the third round, in the fourth round, it was all one-way traffic, and after a while, Terry wasn't even throwing punches anymore. She was just tucked behind that high guard, trying to hang on, trying to endure. Nothing coming back at Sandy. Sandy was able to tee off, having it all her way, finding ways around the guard, punching through it. Seemingly a lost cause for Terry Harper, the two-division champion who was going for three, trying to become a champion at three weights, but falling short falling short greatly greatly overpowered mid-range to inside as stated i went with sandy ryan to win a points decision behind being a bit bigger and a bit stronger more aggressive and she went a step further and forced terry to retire retire on her stool after four rounds now eddie hearn has named natasha jonas as a fight he'd like to make for sandy ryan next it would be for both ibf and wbo titles hearn claimed he would be willing to do it on either side Sky or the zone. Does it happen? Facing Sandy Ryan may be even more dangerous than facing the winner of Lauren Price versus Jessica McCaskill for what would be the WBA title and Natasha's IBF. Facing Sandy might be more dangerous than facing one of them because Sandy's meaner and bigger. Natasha's got a choice. She can face the winner of Lauren Price versus Jessica McCaskill. She can face Sandy Ryan or she can wait for the winner of Ivana Habazin versus Kinga Magyar. For the WBC title. The safest fight for Natasha Natasha, at this point, would have to be the winner of Habazin versus Magyar. I think Lauren, I think Lauren is going to beat Jessica McCaskill, beat her on points, and Lauren's a speedster. Lauren's very fast. Too fast for Natasha. I think she's too fast. If she were to try to fight Sandy Ryan... Sandy's too big. Sandy's too strong. Sandy Ryan might do to Natasha Jonas what she just did to Terry Hopper for the exact same reason, because Natasha, like Terry, is a super featherweight that moved up in weight. She wasn't a true junior middle and she's not a true welter she's strong yes. and she was talented enough to win all those belts at 154 but she's not gonna have a junior middles or a welters durability it's the same thing pardon my french 
but I don't think Natasha Jonas migrated from Matchroom over to Boxer to fight more Matchroom fighters. I mean, she wasn't interested in doing that rematch with Terry Harper, so do you think she's going to want to fight the woman that just stopped her? No. Money no, is an issue. No, no. Matchroom's asking price for a fight never seems to be right for Natasha Jonas. She's been eating good over there at Boxer. She has. And I think the only place a fight like this happens, if it ever happens, would be on the Boxer side of things, but that would require Boxer to want to make it, and I don't think they would. They'd sooner offer her the winner of Price versus McCaskill. Or see about securing her a fight with the winner of Habazin versus Magyar, which could be a cheaper alternative to Sandy Ryan. Petty wants to make it, but I don't think it happens. What could is either a Michaela Mayer fight, who is campaigning as a welterweight these days, and she's coming right off that fight with Natasha Jonas. Maybe you can make a Mayer fight. Maybe you can make a Chantel Cameron fight. Her and Sandy have unfinished business. Things seem to have slowed for what was supposed to be the Chantel Cameron versus Katie Taylor trilogy. If that doesn't happen, maybe Chantel moves up in weight. Maybe Chantel challenges Sandy for that WBO title. That's a good fight, big fight in it of itself. So there still are options out there for Sandy, but I don't think Natasha Jonas is one of them. Network would be willing to pay for it if the fight took place in November. That is that your hypothetical opinion, or or did you get some insinuation from Amazon Prime that you could get the finances for November? Uh, no, the reason that I say November is is two way to do it. One way is to cancel uh, June 15 and go in September and start because if we do it locally in America, we need at least four months to marinate. That is Samson Lukowicz, David Benavidez's longtime promoter, who two days ago spoke to the Boxing Voice and in so many words said that if you wanted to do a Canelo Alvarez fight in September, they would have to cancel his upcoming fight in June. You see, Team Benavidez has changed their tune a bit. Samson is now saying that the fight can happen. David Benavidez just the other day said, don't be surprised if it happens in September. Well, that's when I always figured it would happen. Some discrepancies aside, what Samson is saying is for the fight to happen in September, they would have to cancel David's upcoming fight with Oleksandr Vozdik. If we do it locally in America, we need at least four months to marinate and go to at least six city plus Mexico for press conference. It seems to be his plan of action if they want to do the fight in September. If they want to do it in November, I guess he wouldn't have to cancel his fight with Oleksandr Vozdik. Is that it? Why is Samson Lukowicz talking like he's the lead promoter? Like he's the one who'd be in charge? If anybody would be in charge, it would be Canelo Alvarez and Canelo Alvarez Promotions. What do you mean? Well, what Samson's talking about is the press tour, the promotion, but he wouldn't be the lead promoter in that situation. That wouldn't be up to him. This is what I always tell you. Al Heyman and the PBC's legacy is convincing a bunch of B, C, and D side fighters to behave as if they're the A side, always making things more complex, more difficult than they have to be because they don't want to know their role and stay in their place. All the same, they've changed their tune. Where Samson Lukowicz just the other day was talking about how scared Canelo Alvarez is, now, now he's talking about the potentiality of the fight happening in September. David Benavidez is doing the same thing, but I guess his fans didn't get the memo because these people are still bitching and moaning and bickering and whining. He's fucking whining. What it sounds like to me is Samson Lukowicz doesn't like the turnaround. He doesn't like the idea that David would fight in June, in the middle of June, then snap right back into action in September. That's why they would want to cancel that fight. He's saying it's promotion. I don't believe him. Because the promotion for such a show wouldn't be up to you anyway. So what are you worried about press tours for and promotion? It's not your problem. What it really is, is he doesn't like the turnaround, the quick turnaround, that he'll have a fight with Oleksandr Vozdik that may or may not prove to be a difficult fight. He might get dinged up, even if he wins, just to go back in there with Canelo Alvarez in September. He doesn't want to roll the dice with Vozdik if he can fight Canelo in September. Need I remind you? 
that Joseph Parker squeezed in about four fights in the last 12 months. Anthony Joshua squeezed in four fights in the last 11. And you're saying that you can't fight in June, then fight again in September. And what is the biggest fight of your career, the biggest fight anywhere at or around these weights with the biggest name, that's too much for you. Too much for Samson, anyway. Just no excuse. If you are fortunate enough that Canelo Alvarez wants to fight you in September, you shut the hell up and you play ball because it's an opportunity for you, not an opportunity for him. Team Benavidez can't seem to understand that. Their fans can't either. Just the other day, I had a guy tell me that David Benavidez shouldn't fight for anything under 40% of the pot, 40% of the overall pot or no fight. Is he retarded? He must be. Because what if I told you that all Gennady Golovkin got from the first fight with Canelo was 35%. 35% as a reigning unified champion. That's what he got. You're expecting David, who's just the mandatory, to get more than that? Why? What, because he was on pay-per-view two times last year? Those pay-per-views didn't sell shit. And you're telling me that he should get more than Gennady Golovkin got going into a Canelo Alvarez fight when all he is is a mandatory challenger. And as a mandatory challenger, all he's really entitled to is 25%, which is likely why they never filed that paperwork with the WBC, because they know that. All you're entitled to is 25%. You could probably convince the WBC to bump it up to 30 but not 40. 40 is far too close to 50. Are you out of your fucking mind? David Benavidez fans must be. They're losing it because it's looking more and more like the fight might actually happen, which is unsettling for them. Guys like this have a lot of fun with these narratives up until it's time to fight, up until it's showtime and it's go time, like the Spence fans did for years until it was time for Spence to fight Terrence Crawford. So it was time to fight wasn't fun, not for them, not anymore. And I think the same applies here because here you have Samson Lukowicz saying in plain English that the fight might happen in September and David's saying the same thing, but these people are still complaining. Why? They bought into all the narratives. They drunk the Kool-Aid. In my previous video, we talked about David Benavidez expressed interest to do the fight with Canelo Alvarez in Saudi on Turkey Al Al Sheikh's dime. And he went as far as tagging Turkey Al Al Sheikh, saying that if he loses the fight, he'll donate his entire purse to charity. And if he wins, he'll still donate a portion of it to charity. Sounds good. And it seems that Turkey Al Al Sheikh has responded to him, though I don't think it's the response that David was going for. Per a tweet from Michael Benson, told that His Excellency, Turkey Al Al Sheikh wants to make a fight between David. David Benavidez and the winner of Dimitri Bivol versus Artur Betterbeev in December. He believes this is more practical than Canelo Alvarez versus Benavidez. Bivol versus Betterbeev on June 1st has a rematch clause, but Al Al Sheikh would be open to having Benavidez face the winner in between their two fights. Yeah, I don't think that's the response that David was going for. This essentially puts David Benavidez on the spot. That if that fight with Canelo Alvarez doesn't happen and they don't get anywhere... Well, you're fighting Vozdik for interim status at that weight. You've been telling people that's who you're after, right? The winner of Dimitri Bivol versus Artur Betterbeev. You've been saying you don't care about money. You said it's not about the money, it's about legacy. Okay, well, the whole reason that so many guys chase Canelo Alvarez around is for the money. The Saudis can pay you money to fight the winner of this fight. Good money, very good money. Say it's about legacy. The Canelo Alvarez fight would be an undisputed title fight, but so would this one. This is for undisputed too. So what do you want to do? Do you want to keep doing interviews about Canelo Alvarez or do you want to shoot for undisputed? Do you really want to fight the winner of this fight? Turkey Al Al Sheikh said that this is more practical. Practical in what sense? I don't know. But Canelo Alvarez's detractors have so taken it upon themselves to spin that into Canelo Alvarez's pricing himself out when Turkey Al Al Sheikh didn't say that. If he comes out and says it, then I understand. But nowhere in there does it say that Canelo was asking for too much money. What it does does say is that this is more practical and when you think about it David's supposed to have a fight on schedule in June for WBC interim status which would make him the most practical choice for the winner of this fight maybe that's the kind of practicality that he's talking about 
that they're on the same schedule. The fight between Dimitri and Artur is supposed to happen the same month as the fight between David and Oleksandr. They're on the same schedule. Thus, it's a practicality. You take care of business in June, you fight the winner of this fight in September or November. It's for a lot of money. It's for Undisputed. What's the problem? Or do you want to keep chasing around Canelo Alvarez and doing interviews about him, worrying about him when there's an opportunity right in front of you? I would pick either guy to beat David Benavidez because he's too basic. Dimitri, Artur, hell, some people aren't convinced he's going to make it past Oleksandr, let alone make it to them, though if he did, I would pick either one of those two guys to beat David because he's too fucking fucking basic. Basic. His Excellency, Turkey al Sheik is a true blue boxing fan, you understand? Yeah. He knows the sport, he knows it well. And it's interesting that he thought this more practical for David than a Canelo Alvarez fight. Money is no object to these people, and there was no mention of money, at least not here. He didn't say nothing about money. It's a practicality. If you're about to fight for WBC interim status at the same weight as these boys, it's only right. It's only natural, practical, that you face the winner of the fight, that you fight them next. But do you want to? I remember immediately after Dimitri Bivol's big upset went over Canelo, David Benavidez took to name calling, took to doing interviews about how he'd knock out Dimitri Bivol. He's confident. He would stop him. Have at him, cowboy. If he wins in June, you may yet get your chance. If you want it. What if Artur wins? Same deal. Same opportunity. It's fun disputed. They beat his ass. Dimitri Bivol would do to David Benavidez what we already saw him do to Zerto Ramirez because Zerto and David are cut from the same cookie cutter. They're not that different. All they ever were at super middleweight were two very big guys cutting big weight to get down there. All they were really doing was outsizing guys at super middleweight, but in terms of nuts and bolts boxing skills, functionality, David makes far too many mistakes that he wouldn't be able to get away with at light heavyweight. He hyperextends, lunging, leaning over his lead foot. He squares up at times, giving his opponent both shoulders, both feet, losing form that should a counter shot get in, he won't have that back foot behind him to support his weight. And he could get knocked off balance like he got knocked off balance by Ronald Gavril walking into a punch. He makes mistakes he can get away with at 168 behind clever matchmaking, not fighting very many, if any, punchers. All he's really doing is outsizing guys. He may seem a big guy at 168, but not so big at 175. He's too simple for Dimitri Bivol. Dimitri would do to him what he did to Zerto. The only real difference between David and Zerto is that David is an orthodox fighter, whereas Zerto, he's a southpaw. David isn't actually a Mexican national, whereas Zerto Ramirez he is, and even though David is a little faster, a little faster to the eye than Zerto Ramirez, he makes a lot of mistakes that his supporters don't notice. It's too simple for Dimitri, and he's not strong enough for Artur. Those cute little shoe shines he gets away with at 168, he wouldn't get away with that at 175, not with Artur and not in the pocket. He's too strong. Do you think for a second that a guy like Caleb Plant could go 12 rounds with Artur? Because he went 12 rounds with David. Artur would kill him. It's all coming to a head now, and we'll see what kind of fighter David really is.